Hello, welcome to the Friday, August 6, 2021 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Stockheim, Germany. Cisco released a number of updates today. At the top of these updates are a critical vulnerability in the Cisco RB340 and 345 small business routers. These routers have had a very rich vulnerability history. And yet again, do we have arbitrary code execution or denial of service without authentication on these devices by sending crafted HTTP requests. No exact details how this exactly happens, what the exact nature of the vulnerability is, other than an urgent request uh, to patch uh, the vulnerable firmware, and of course, not to expose your admin interfaces on devices like this. Like I mentioned, there was a rich history of similar vulnerabilities in the past. I would also be a little bit careful with the similar devices that may be end of life that are not explicitly listed in this advisory. And Trustwave's Spider Lab came across an interesting vulnerability in Telegram on Mac OS affecting self-destructing messages. This is a difficult feature to implement correctly. The idea is that as soon as a user opens a message, it will self-destruct, meaning all evidence of the message will be deleted from the recipient's system. The problem is that even before a user actually opens the message within Telegram, a copy of the message, in particular media files, are written to a cache file. A user is now able to open the cache file without triggering the self-destruct logic, and that way the image remains on the recipient's system. I don't think there's really sort of a bulletproof way to implement these self-destruct messages. A user should always be able to capture messages before they're being displayed. They may be from memory or maybe just by taking screenshots or literally taking a picture off a screen with, for example, a smartphone. And of course, Black Hat briefings are underway and we have a couple stories here that emerged from that. Uh, for example, two researchers, Xapa Fitzel and uh, Wojciech Regula, came up with a number of different ways to bypass the transparency, consent and control system in Mac OS. The idea of this system is to give the user more control what software has access to specific restricted files, like for example, the document folder, addresses and the like. So you'll, if you are a Mac user, you probably saw the pop-ups where the system is asking for permission. And this goes beyond sort of simple user-based access control, but it matters what software actually accesses that data. Now, in order to enforce uh, these controls, there is some system software, actually multiple binaries that are able uh, to alter this uh, TCC state. And uh, the evasion techniques that these researchers came up with all essentially relied on compromising software with the special permission and in doing so bypassing or altering the controls and providing access uh, to the particular uh, data. Now, read and write is again separated here. It's being pointed out here. So for example, just providing a software with read access may not allow that particular malware, if it is malware then to write to uh, that uh, same uh, data. So for example, that puts some additional constraints on abusing some of these flaws using ransomware. And then another uh, talk at Black Hat Briefings uh, dove into the details of a vulnerability that Microsoft fixed recently, CVE 2021-34466. This was a weakness in Windows Hello, and it's, again, one of those difficult to avoid problems. Windows Hello allows you to log in uh, to your Windows systems, and one authentication method it supports is the use of a camera. Now, it does try to be 
better than just simple facial recognition. It does also use infrared images, which uh, tend to be more difficult to uh, spoof with just a simple photo. But what these researchers found was that you are able to collect an infrared image of a subject and then create a USB device that identifies itself as a camera and essentially replace that uh, infrared image. And with that, they were able uh, to bypass Windows Hello. Now, Microsoft patched the vulnerability, but of course there is no sort of fundamental patch to it. What they did is they now ask for additional permissions to use an external camera for Windows Hello, and they also restricted the camera brands to be used. Apple, on the other hand, actually got some flack for being very restrictive with its Face ID system. The Face ID camera cryptographically authenticates uh, to the iOS device using it, but that again then causes problems if you, for example, swap the camera at non-authorized uh, shop, they're not able to reestablish that cryptographic connection, and then your camera won't work. So Microsoft, of course, has a hard time supporting the wide range of hardware that it is known to support. Well, it's Friday again, and uh, I do have an SDI student with me here, uh, Jamie Castile. Uh, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh, my name is Jamie Castile. I'm currently a, a senior penetration tester for ScienceLogic. Uh, before that, I worked in uh, consultant agencies, also worked uh, manufacturing environments and healthcare, trying to shore up security practices and you know, kind of fight the overall fight. So your paper was actually about sort of one of my favorite topics, uh, content security policy. Uh, could you explain a little bit what the paper was all about? Yeah, so content security policy, I mean, as you know, right, it's one of your favorites. You know, it's 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 increasing in in popularity. So this the reason why I wanted to look at potential bypass opportunities uh, was really because I started to see it more commonly on web application assessments that I was performing at the time. Um, so really wanted me to, to, to dive in deeper into the technology as far as, you know, kind of what it does, where it came from, and kind of look at some of those, uh, you know, bypass opportunities from an attacker side, as well as kind of helpful things for the defenders as well. You already kind of pointed to sort of bypass our techniques. And one of the issues, of course, with CSP that also causes people not to use it is, hey, it can be bypassed. And that's, of course often a problem with security technologies that they're sort of disregarded because, well, there is some exploit, some vulnerability, or some way to bypass them. In the end, it's often coming down to, is it worth the trouble to implement that technology? What are some of the benefits and caveats here you sort of came up with when you did your research? I mean, kind of what you pinpointed, right? Overall, you know, um, I'm a big proponent of just because something can be bypassed, you know, should you throw it out? And in this paper, I really look at, you know, obviously CSP is bypassable, right? It's kind of the, the whole point of the paper. Um, a lot of security controls are, as you mentioned, but uh, is it worth having as part of, uh, you know, a defense in depth strategy? I would argue, yes, it is, right? Um, so really allowing or having that extra layer that an attacker or could be attacker could, would have to get through. Um, to penetrate your defenses is definitely worth having. Now, um, for people new to CSP, can you sort of outline some of the restrictions that uh, CSP can impose here? Yeah, I mean, part of the biggest issue whenever you start to run CSP from a defender side, right, like on your application is some things may not work, right? And so part of the thing with CSP is if you have it too restrictive, you could have issues with your site, um, also, some older um, applications or kind of interfaces with other applications do require some of the unsafe directives that are kind of discussed in the paper. Um, obviously, those are less than ideal to use. You know, uh, they do lay it out pretty straightforward being unsafe, right, in the directive. But, um, you know, it's really um, that's kind of part of the problem with with trying to implement something like that. Right. Is it, it can be frustrating from a defender standpoint to make things work properly. Implementing CSP myself on you know, legacy websites, basically, that I'm sort of operating. The problem, of course, is uh, they were created um, not with CSP in mind. So 
one problem that I often run into, for example, is uh, inline style sheets and inline JavaScript. Uh, I know it's sloppy, but hey, it's life. You know, uh, you end up with style tags all over uh, your uh, your web page. Uh, how could an attacker take advantage of, for example, uh, an issue like this where I have to enable um, inline styles, inline JavaScript uh, because my website just has it all over and I'm too lazy to clean it all up? Yeah, I mean, the, the, you kind of you kind of pinpointed it there, right? Uh, I wouldn't. I mean, lazy is a part of it too, you know. But uh, another big part of it is obviously time, right? Uh, yeah. Things need to be up and functional. A thing I do, you know, whenever I'm looking at an application like that, is test the inputs, right? Especially for reflective type of uh, cross-site scripting or other uh, potential types of content injection, you know. So as an attacker, I'm looking to. Um, regardless of CSP is in place or not, I'm looking to test all the inputs to see kind of what is reflected back, what is stored, what I could access at another point. Um, so specifically taking advantage of, you know, uh, an unsafe inline directive, you know, or something like that in a CSP um, is something I, I look to do whenever I do see a, a site that does utilize content security policy. My goal is to see, well, let me look here. This is allowed here, unsafe inline from this source. Okay, let's see if I can take advantage of that. One method that I sort of was playing a little bit is now, yes, I have to keep all this JavaScript around in my uh, site, but one real neat thing they added in uh, CSP was these nonces where I can sort of, you know, uh, mark JavaScript as being mine by sort of adding this uh, random string to it. Uh, do you see any sort of implementation issues uh, with those nonces or uh, anything from a penetration tester? point of view that uh, people should be aware of? Yeah, there definitely could be, right? So one thing from from a, a pen testing point of view is you want to see if, if you do see a nunce, right, or a hash value, you do want to see if that's actually something, right? Sometimes those could be hard-coded and actually not kind of refreshed on a reload, mm -hmm. right? And if that's the case, then it's really, you know, kind of uh, security through obscurity in a way, right? So that's something yeah. to keep in mind. Yeah, so you don't want to, the attacker to be able to just pick up the nuns and then include it in their exploit. Yeah, uh, exactly. It's a, it's a little bit more work. Uh, I guess it keeps the real kitties out there, but uh, uh, it's it's not real security. So on, on each refresh, on each page load, you pretty much need a new randomly generated nuns. Yes, that, and, you know. and the paper does discuss that just a little bit, kind of for a help for defenders too, right? Because that's a big thing for me, obviously being uh, on the, the, the attacking side, there's a reason to be an attacker, right? It's all kind of part of the same thing. The goal for me is to, you know, help the defenders also shore up, you know, the application, right? Not just to own all the things, so to speak. Another sort of practical issue that I ran into is that you don't code all the JavaScript and all these style sheets yourself on a site. Uh, let's say you're using jQuery or such. Um, um, jQuery, I believe the data URLs, for example, they're required if you're using jQuery, all kinds of stuff breaks if you don't allow that. Uh, do you run to a lot of sites where really the consecutive policy, what you can do is limited uh, by those third-party libraries that people are including? You know, honestly, no. Most of the content security policies I see, are, I mean, some of them are very massive and very elaborate to kind of unfold. But there's a lot of asterisks, you know, which are used as wildcard, right, for mm -hmm. sources in there. Most of the times those are made for, you know, it's like, uh, specific subdomains to be allowed to do things, but occasionally those misconfigurations can come up, and I do cover that in in the paper as well, right? Kind of how to look at that as from a wildcard perspective. But for the most part, most of the CSP implementations I've seen during testing have been um, either really advanced with a large list of directives and and sources, you know, to allow, um, or very simplistic. Is it sometimes sort of like in firewall rules where you know you have these massive firewall rule lists, but and in the end, it's really logically just an any any. It's, yeah, pretty. Yeah, something that you much. run into. <laughs> yeah, no, it really seems because there was one I was looking, you know, in the responses I was getting from the application, and I swear it was like every website in the world was listed as allow, <laughs> right? Which is daunting, and it makes looking at responses annoying, right? Yeah, <laughs> uh, but I don't know how effective that actually was. In your paper, you go over more details about different attacks, but you also talk about the defenses. I'll add a link in the show notes uh, where people can find uh, the paper. Anything you sort of want to do next or so now that uh, you have written the paper? And where are you sort of in your STI program? 
Yeah. So SDI program wise, I've got um, around you know six credit hours left, right? My my next course I'm really looking forward to take is the uh, for the GCPN, the cloud pen testing certification. Obviously, a lot more companies are going to the cloud and things. Uh, the perimeter is more blurred than ever, right? Every more every day. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. And really, overall, the, the program has been fantastic. Uh, I've been able to learn a lot and actually be able to use that knowledge in in day to day work, which is fantastic. So, yeah, uh, thanks uh, for joining me here. And uh, again, the link to the paper will be in the show notes and uh, talk to you again on Monday. Bye.